Good morning. Let's begin this morning by singing number 449, Oh to be like thee, 449. Scripture reading will be from Hebrews chapter 1, 1 through 5. If you'd like to turn with me. God, who hath at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these days, these last days, spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they, for unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, and again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And Father, we thank thee for the night's rest. We thank you for this beautiful morning. Pray that you'll be with us this morning as we have come together to study thy word as brothers and sisters. We pray for, this, pray, pray for our sick this morning. We pray that you'll be with them and bless them and help them to get well. Also, we pray for those that are bereaved. Pray that you'll continue to bless us in our daily lives. Pray that we will live good lives. Pray, Heavenly Father, that you might forgive us of the sins in our lives. Go with us now through the remainder of this service. In Christ's name, amen.
It is indeed a beautiful morning outside and a beautiful morning inside to be here with you all. Thank you for your presence this morning for our Bible study period. We are certainly grateful for the opportunity to be here. We'll now dismiss our classes with the nursery preschool, kindergarten, and elementary school. Middle school, high school, and adult classes are dismissed as well. Good morning, 2 Timothy chapter 3 is our place of study this morning as we continue working our way through this book, 2 Timothy chapter 3. <clears throat> Good to see each of you here. Paul in this particular chapter is giving some, I guess in some way you could say encouragement, but uh, in some ways I guess it would be somewhat discouraging to realize that the days ahead are going to be perilous times. And yet, as Timothy is facing these perilous times, Paul realizes that he's not going to be around much longer to help or encourage Timothy in that regard. As he notes in the closing chapter of this letter, the time of my departure is at hand. And so he's trying to prepare, trying to forewarn, and in other ways trying to encourage Timothy to continue to be sound, to continue to encourage others to be sound, to think about the kind of life that he's living in an effort to not only save himself, but those who will hear his teaching and preaching as well. <clears throat> in the earlier part of this chapter, we have been noting the characteristics of those who will bring about these perilous times. And in the description of these people, where does Paul begin? What does he list first? Lovers of their own selves. And then it goes downhill from there, doesn't it? And as we have noted throughout the study thus far, you know, one thing just leads to another. And whenever a man is a, is a lover of himself, well, let's just stop right there a minute and ask a question. Is it wrong to love self? <clears throat> All right. In this context, what is the implication of the phrase lovers of their own selves? That's their first priority. They're about the only ones they do love. And when you read down through the other uh, things there, the blasphemers, disobedient, unthankful, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. <clears throat> Who else do they love? With that description, I'd say they don't love anybody else. <clears throat> and as a result of that, these kinds of people will bring in perilous times. And then we were uh, noting last week uh, <clears throat> down in verses uh, 7 and 8, ever learning and never able to come to knowledge of the truth simply because they are not seeking truth where it can be found. Where is truth? In God's Word. Truth is connected with God. Truth is connected with spiritual things. What were they connected to? Material things. 
lovers of pleasure more than, rather than, literally, lovers of God. So they didn't love God. If you don't love God, you're not going to be too interested in truth, are you? Because God's Word is truth, John 17, 17. Then in verse 8, he gives um, an example here of those, uh, what we refer to as a case history, I suppose, of those who can be seen for what they are. So do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. So that gives you further description of these kinds of people. All of this lifestyle that is mentioned up in these first few verses is probably summed up in that phrase that is found there, corrupt minds, men of corrupt minds. We noted in that regard, and this was right at the end of our study last week, where does our whole life Began anyway. Things that we do, things that we say, where do they where do they start? In the heart, in the mind. So if we have corrupt minds, what kind of life are we going to live? Corrupt lives. If we are spiritually minded, then our lives will be more spiritual, will they not? And so it all begins as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Proverb writer said, Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. If someone speaks hatefully, what do you know about them? They've got a hateful heart. Someone speaks kindly to you, what do you know? They have a kind heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And so, uh, those are the kind of people under consideration here. Reprobate concerning the faith. What is the idea of a reprobate? No, it's not good. A reprobate is one who is opposed to. And you'll notice up there earlier uh, when he talked about uh, despisers of those that are good. Who are they against? Everybody that's good. And so those are the kinds of people who will bring about perilous times. But then um, in verse 9 he says, But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all, as theirs also was. Now he's reverting back there to Janus and Jambres, but he's saying concerning these people, you're going to find out what they're all about sooner or later. How did Jesus word that concept? By their fruits ye shall know them. And so when people are uh, divisive, when people are hateful, when people are, and you go back up and look at that whole list of things, uh, any one of those characteristics, what do you know about them? They're not spiritually minded. Uh, they have an agenda, usually of their own. Uh, they're interested only in that which interests them, and they don't care who they hurt in the process. But people that way will be known, will they not? I mean, you can know by the way they live their lives. You know by the way they act. You know by the way they talk. You know by what they do, the kind of people they are. Now, is that judging? Fruit inspecting. Uh, yeah, Brother Marshall Keeble used to say that's fruit inspecting. By their fruit ye shall know them. Do we have a right to do that? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Do we have a right to judge? Oh, yes, we do. We have a right to judge. Not hypocritical judgment. And, you know, that's why a lot of folks want to go to Matthew 7, verse 1, judge not that you be not judged, and put a period right there. But Jesus 
thoughts in that regard continued on, didn't they? He was dealing with hypocritical judgment. So when you think about, for example, uh, Paul's statement in, in writing to Titus on heretic, after the first and second admonition, reject. Well, if we can't judge, how would we ever determine who's a heretic? Couldn't do that, could you? Uh, in uh, Paul's writing to the church at Thessalonica, withdraw from those that walk disorderly. If we couldn't judge, how would we determine who's disorderly and who's not? So there's obviously some judging that is allowed, and it's referred to in the Bible as righteous judgment. And so we can judge, we can be fruit inspectors, if you want to call it that, and by their fruits. Now we can't judge motives, we can't judge hearts, but we can judge conduct, we can judge speech, we can judge attitude. Those things are evident. They're open. And we can observe those things and make judgments accordingly. So these people, uh, by their fruits, you'll know them. Uh, but he just wants Timothy to know that they will come. You know, wouldn't it be great if you could just sit back and, and think, you know, I'm never going to cross paths with anybody except a faithful child of God. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? I mean, everybody I talk to is going to be a faithful child of God. Never going to have to hear bad language, never going to have to see filthy conduct, never going to have to, you know, deal with all of the world's problems, because everybody's good. But who believes that? Uh, you've got your head in the sand if you do, because we're going to face certain things in life. Well, how's, the, how's one of the, how is one of the best ways to handle things that may crop up in the future? to be made aware that it could happen. And then you'll be ready for it. Have you ever heard of anybody? Have you ever been blindsided by anything? I mean, boy, something just jump up and hit you and you had no clue it was coming. Most of us probably have. You were not prepared for it. And you didn't deal with it very well. But if you know something is coming, you can make some preparation. So Paul is saying to Timothy, Timothy, you need to get ready. Because these are the kinds of times that you're going to face. And so don't be blindsided by it. Don't let it catch you unexpectedly. So we noted in the outline there, point D, just go back and, and retrace and see what the effect is that they will, will have. So you begin with the personal life. They're selfish. They're stuck up. They're slanderous. If they're that way in their own personal life, what other areas of life is that going to affect? Every other area of life. Whether it's family, social, spiritual, whatever the case might be. So, you begin with the personal life, and then it goes into family life. You look back up at that person. He's a lover of his own self. He's covetous. He's proud. How's that going to affect family life? Well, we talked about some of that as we, as we went through that uh, particular concept. So it's going to affect family life. People marry, have any respect for authority. They're lacking in gratitude. That's going to affect things along the way in their marriage relationship. It'll affect things when children come along without natural affection. Stated in the verses. So if they have that kind of a track record in their personal life, in their family life, how do you think it's going to affect their social life? What kind of person are they going to be socially? Well, I don't know about you, but they're going to be, kind of be the kind of people I don't particularly care about being around. If all they want to talk about is themselves, all they want to talk about is their accomplishments, nobody else in the world worth anything except them, Gets kind of old hearing that after a while, doesn't it? Who wants to be around that kind of a person? So one who has a bad track record in personal life and family life, you wouldn't expect much more in social life. When he talks about those who are, who are false accusers, where does that begin? 
with selfishness. Lack of self-control. We mentioned that with the word incontinent. Truce breakers carries that idea. Well, if it's that way in personal life, family life, social life, what do you expect out of that person spiritually? Well, you better not expect a whole lot of anything out of them spiritually. About the only thing that they can have spiritually with that kind of life is exactly what Paul says right here, a form. That's about all they can have. It's not going to be real. It's just going to be a form. Just be a pretense of religion if they have anything at all. So they, they love pleasure. Spiritual life is nothing but a form to them. You ever known anybody that used religion for business purposes? I have. You ask somebody, well, you know, why, why do you attend a church over there? Well, it's a bigger congregation, got more influential people. You know, that helps my business. Pretty sad motive for religious matters, isn't it? Not the Church of Christ. No, glad you cleared that up. <laughs> but there are people like that. that. Their religion is something that they use to gain, well, what's their problem? Lovers of their own selves. They want what they want out of life. Now, there's one other aspect of life that has to be considered. And that's future life. People are that way in their personal life, family life, social life, spiritual life. What about their future life? And in here I'm not talking about eternity. I'm talking about just the days ahead. What's it going to be like? Well, you go over to verse 13 and he says what? Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. It's not going to get better. Does that mean that people can't change? No, Paul is stating a general principle here, and we'll get more into that later, but, but the point is, generally speaking, people who are of this nature will only get worse with time. Now, if you want to talk about eternity in that regard, what does the future hold for them there? It's not a pretty picture, is it? And you think about it. They have created havoc here, having their own way. They're going to pay the price on down the road. You know, in, in all of the arguments of heaven and hell and that kind of thing, and you know, some people that want to believe in heaven don't believe in a hell and that kind of thing. When you look at a passage like this, Why would there not be, if there is a heaven, for those who struggle to live a righteous life in, in spite of this kind of influence in the world, why is there not something for these kind of people to have to deal with eternally? I mean, righteousness and justice can only be served in that regard. And when you read about, for example, in Romans uh, uh, chapter 1, Romans chapter 2, I'm sorry. Let me double check that. Romans chapter 2, yeah. Where Paul talks about the judgment. And other places as well. Judgment is, is classified as just judgment. Just judgment. What would be just about one who struggles to live a godly life being rewarded and one who could care less and lives a, this kind of a life not being punished eternally. Where's justice in that? Is it Richard, you had your... Are you saying that, that folks would lie at a funeral? Is that what you're saying, Richard? 
Yeah, yeah, I, I've I've been there, I, and I think all of us have. We we've known people who uh, who uh, I guess godliness was the furthest thing from their life, and yet at the whatever funeral service they have, um, they they're okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's why it is difficult, that's why it's very difficult for gospel preachers to conduct services of people that they know are not faithful. What do you say? What comfort can you give the family? You know, I mean, it, it, you're pretty much left out in the cold, and that's hard. Uh, and what I usually try to do in cases like that is ignore the deceased and deal with those who are still alive. Try to encourage their faithfulness and greater spirituality and whatever. But, it, uh, but yes, in the world in general, uh, you don't hear that kind of thing. All right. In verse 10 and following, Timothy, as we noted in the outline, needs to be aware that there is deliverance for the faithful. I mean, if these perilous times are coming and these kind of people are going to, to be um, on the horizon for Timothy and, and other faithful Christians, is there any way out? Can we be faithful in spite of that? Well, that's the thing that he's trying to encourage here in these verses. So he's not, to, he's not painted a very rosy picture at this point in these first nine verses. It's just not been pretty at all. But he does paint a picture that is real. When you look at the world in general, it's not a pretty picture, is it? I mean, even, you know, even now as we're going through some very difficult times in, in our nation, and it's, it's hard to sit and listen to the news without becoming so frustrated and discouraged. It's like, what do I do? Well, and then you look at all of the sin around, day in and day out, people with whom you have to associate if you live in this world. What can I do? Can we survive it? Well, definitely we can. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, Manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. So, what's Paul doing at this point? He's saying, Timothy, you are a real man living in a real world that's not pretty at all. But you know, you've been with me, you've seen what's happened. All of these things have come my way, but yet what? God's always been there for me. Hebrews 13, 6, what did God promise? I will never leave thee nor forsake thee so that we may boldly say the Lord is my helper I will not fear what men shall do to me back in Matthew chapter 10 I believe it's down about verse 28 where Jesus was um, sending out certain ones on a limited commission he was telling them that they were going to suffer a lot of things beatings, scourgings hunger whatever. But he said, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And so, why would Jesus make a statement like that? Why would Paul talk to Timothy about things like this? Simply because living a faithful Christian life 
is not an easy way to go. Is that a part of our problem, you think, even in the church today? We've got too many people who want an easy way of life, don't want any controversy, don't want any conflict, want everything to come up smelling roses. And folks, it's just not going to happen. We're living that faithful Christian life, and you'll get more into that in verse 12. So in verses 10 and 11, he gives us an established fact. Actually gives two facts in these, in these verses. One, the fact of difficulties in the Christian's life. And secondly, the fact of God's presence and deliverance for the faithful. And he wants Timothy to see that. Could Timothy not see the, the, the distinction, the difference, the contrast between Paul's life and the life of the false teachers? You know Timothy could see that. And that's why Paul bringing, is bringing up some of these things. He is, of course, a case in point in that regard. God, <coughs> excuse me, God delivered him. And Timothy knew this. So before these rough spot co spots come, Paul wants Timothy to know you've got help. You've got help. And that's God. So these places that Paul mentions, Iconium, Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, these are places that that Timothy knew. These are places where Paul had suffered and God had delivered him. You notice in this, in this section, he mentions Lystra. What happened at Lystra? Anybody recall? Wasn't that where Paul was stoned and left for dead at Lystra? What was the outcome of that? He's still going, isn't he? God delivered him out of that. And so these things Timothy could, could think back and relate to, and it's like, yeah, I remember that. I know that. It would be a point of encouragement to him in his life. So not only do you have an established fact in these verses, you have an encouraging fact. And of course, that's, that's really the thing that Paul had in mind in writing this. Yes, to warn, let Timothy know what's going to happen, but to encourage him. Now you think about where we have been in this letter thus far. Going back to chapter 1, he has encouraged Timothy to stir up the gift that's in him. Fan the flame, literally there. Timothy's discouraged. Now, if he is discouraged when Paul is writing this letter, and yet he's still got to face these perilous times ahead, and Paul's not going to be there to help him, in person at least, what can Paul do for him? He can give him encouragement now, and he can provide for him this letter that will encourage him later on. And What, what, what do you do with, with letters that are of vital importance to you? You save them. And in difficult times, you go back and read them, don't you? You go back and let them remind you of whatever the problem is that they were designed to, to help with. And Timothy could do that in this regard. So he knows this, that God did deliver. God does deliver. That's, that's the promise that he's given to us in this regard. But you'll notice as well in verse 12, Paul is not unique in this, is he? He uses himself in verses 10 and 11, but he says in verse 12, Yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now we pull that passage out of its context so often and, and use it. I, I'm not saying we pull it out and use it incorrectly, but, but do we really stop and realize 
the context in which it is stated. Paul has just used himself as an example. Timothy is going to face difficult times ahead in his own life. But what about other Christians along the way? What about us? Yea, and what? All that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Just a thought question here. Do you really have to stop and think for an extended period of time about persecution in your own life as a faithful Christian? Do you suffer as a faithful child of God enough, so much, so often that it's readily on your mind? Or do you have to stop and think, do I really suffer any persecution at all? What does he say? Yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So if we're not suffering, that ought to be a key to us to kind of take a look at ourselves, shouldn't it? Are we as faithful as we need to be? Are we as are we as um, well, progressive, I guess, is the word that comes to mind. That's not the word I'm looking for. Aggressive probably would be a better word. Are we aggressive in our not only living the Christian life, but talking to others about it? Do we take a stand when we believe something is wrong? Are we willing to confront others with sin in their lives? Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Well, I'm not going to have anything to do with it, but I'm not going to say anything about it. That's not biblical. So are we, are we involved in this thing called Christianity to the point that it generates any persecution against us. And if we don't, we might want to take a look at this verse and then take a look at our own lives in that regard. It will come. And this, this, is not a, this is not a maybe might be kind of situation. This is a statement of fact from inspiration itself. This is what will happen. Uh, Roger. Well, then don't. Right. Number one, he's not going to put more on us than we can bear. Persecution is going to come. It may only come in the form of mental action, but there'll be things that we really wish wouldn't be that way, that it bothers us, that it troubles us. But in studying this, I don't think God intends for us to be walking around suffering all the time. But he is saying if you live God. Well, it definitely applies to us. When he says all that live godly, that, in, that includes you and me. And his statement is, they shall suffer persecution. As a result of your efforts to live a godly life, there's going to be adversity that comes your way. That, that's what persecution is. And so um, it's, it's not a might be, it's a, it's a definite statement of fact. And so uh, we don't want to, and I, and I realize, and you do too, that living in, in the land that we currently live in, and I'm not sure how long it's going to be that kind of land, but, but the kind of land that we have been living in, for the most part, we would not suffer the kinds of persecution that Timothy faced, that Paul faced. We're not going to be stoned for what we believe. We're not going to be put to death for what we believe, at least presently. But there are other forms of persecution. Probably the strongest thing that we face as Christians in, in our country and in our part of the country is um, 
some kind of derogatory statement that somebody would make against you because of what you believe, teach, practice. Uh, but as far as any physical persecution, you may lose some friends. And I, I believe there are a lot of Christians, quote unquote, who are failing in their Christianity because they're more concerned about friendships than they are standing up for the truth. And if I, you know, if I take a stand for truth or if I speak up against what's wrong, you know, if I deal with my friends in that way, they won't be my friends anymore. Well, you know, there's a very cold fact that we need, well, maybe I should say a very hot fact that we need to face. If we cherish friendship here on this earth more than we cherish truth, and we're going to lose our souls in hell. If you want to challenge that statement, go ahead. But I believe it's the truth. If we cherish friendships here more than we cherish truth, we're going to lose our souls in hell. Yes, sir. Exactly. Well, I mean, you know, do you think do you think Satan really wants you to be a member of the Lord's church? I don't believe he does. But if you're a member of the Lord's church anyway, but you're just sitting on the bench doing nothing, Satan still got you, doesn't he? He's got you. But the more aggressive you are against him, the more aggressive he's going to be against you. That, that's very true, Richard. The Bible holds that up. Good point. All right. Uh, we'll pick up there, Lord willing, next uh, Sunday. Sometimes I don't even get it, Jeanette. <laughs>